very very warm afternoon to all of you uh, i on behalf of the uh, merchant chamber and all the audience that is watching live thank you uh, especially uh, shri satish jha a very senior veteran uh, journalist also apart from the other hats that he wears uh, he would not know me or remember me i know him since his janasatta days because as students of journalism that is uh, you know we watched him uh, perform magic and wonders out there so uh, i take great pleasure in welcoming mr david wilcox mr jagdish barucha mr axel angeli mr dr kevin desai mr satya narayan mr raghav chandra and my dear friend uh, vincent pala who is an honorable member of parliament from shillong uh, i have great pleasure in extending a warm and hearty welcome to all of you to this webinar on digital learning post covid the way forward we have an extremely distinguished panel to deliberate and discuss on important issues of digital learning uh, this covid disruption has actually taught us that uh, you know work uh, as work from home is important so is uh, digital learning because a big part of the conversation is happening in online classes for children and uh, from schools to universities and also uh, you know people are using this time to uh, pick up skill sets uh you know again through online learning and everything so digital learning is definitely uh going to be in our lives and uh, in fact it should probably take up a dedicated amount of space and time of our internet and of our life going forward every day we are extremely thankful to sri satish jha chairman edufront and olpc for facilitating the discussion i would like to say olpc stands here for one laptop per child i think it's a very unique initiative and you should all try to find out more about it uh, as we all know that with the distinctive rise of e learning covid 19 pandemic has changed mode of education forever impacting billions of students worldwide with the sudden shift away from the classroom we are yet to ascertain the full impact on the education sector in a country like india with its rich demographic there is a growing need for coordinated efforts by all the stakeholders as i was mentioning the the chalkboard uh, has replaced the electronic screen how it will reach each and every school is something we will have to see uh, in a country that is already internet uh, penetration is not completely there how we can reach each child to deliver uh, mass uh, education is something we hope that this panel is able to give some uh, light on several initiatives have been taken by the central government of india ministry of hrd and ugc have sought to enable digital learning through audio video mode or through ebooks and journals the swayam prabha initiative intends to address the problem of non uniform internet penetration in the country by offering 32 high quality educational channels through dth across the nation the content for these channels are provided by esteemed educational uh, education institutes of the nation like iit ugc ncrt etc there is also provision of digital repository of journals and books in national digital library of india and the virtual labs that simulate an environment to perform experiments for an economy like india where internet penetration is 36% internet users per 100 standard 78 fixed broadband subscription at 100 standard 1.34 and 46% of the household with television depending on the mode of delivery of education in the midst of this pandemic my pandemic is a huge task particularly so owing to the dis existing digital excite uh, divide on top of this electricity sometimes is not sufficient for the internet delivery mechanism according to unified district information system for education data india has a network of nearly 15 lakh schools 25 crore students 94 lakh teachers at the school level and 50000 higher education institutions this prevents manifold challenges in transcending from physical delivery of education to online teaching method with educational institutions closed for almost 4 months the major challenge at this stage is to standardize learning by reducing information asymmetries and to introduce a robust monitoring method to gauge the activities of the students remotely with educational institutions operating out of metro cities and tier 1 and tier 2 cities are well adapted to the remote learning techniques schools in tier 3 and tier 4 are struggling in terms of bringing all students of a class on board in a single platform for streamlined dissemination of lesson videos there have been reported instances in three in tier three four towns and other remote areas where guardians have raised the issue of not having a smartphone which may stand in the way of not accessing the learning content sent by the school 
In rural areas, factors like reliability of power supply, device ownership, digital skills of teachers and students are of great significance. In the urban areas, digital learning experience and outcomes of children in private schools are way ahead of that of children attending public schools because of adaptiveness of private schools, teachers in integrating and instructions with digital devices. However, at the same time, there is a growing debate of how much screen time is good enough or how much screen time is, uh, you know, is more than, I think the courts have already said not to subject children to more than two hours of screen time. So capacity building of the teachers towards digital mode is the need of the hour. In higher learning, it becomes imperative to raise the standards of online content in terms of standardizing and accrediting users to mark a phase managed shift towards the education for ensuring a streamlined flow of lessons, coordination between teachers and students is a must at all levels for discussing the challenge faced in day-to-day -day digital operations. The teachers, although are smart, but they need to adapt to this new medium at a much faster pace than they thought in the past. Proper assessments uh, through digital medium is extremely important because we need to benchmark our students and rather than grading in the context of crisis, methods of evaluation should identify strengths and weakness of each student, which is utmost importance. I have noticed only, I have noted and mentioned only a few points, but I, I hope our learned speakers and panel will deliberate on many more points and the outcome would be that each one of us takes home a lot of ideas and, uh, on which we could work on or on which uh, we could get some idea on how the country and the nation and the uh, globe uh, moves ahead. Uh, with these words, uh, I hand it over to uh, Shri Jha. Thank you very, very much. Uh, yes, I remember St. Mark as a great newspaper of all times. In fact, Banaras was the first place where I heard about it as I grew up. And thank you very much for reminding me of old times when I was in journalism. And um, uh, this is uh, Manmanji has taken the initiative and brought us all together. And thank you, thank you Manmanji. I would like to hand it over to David Wilcox, a very dear friend and uh, a partner in ReachScale, where he pulled me in and he will moderate the session. David, uh, let me hand it over to you. David? Okay. Um, while... pleasure, to be, pleasure to be hosted here by the Merchants Chamber. Appreciate uh, them uh, pulling together such a great audience. And I'm honored to be here with all our panelists. I'm also a little intimidated to be in West Bengal, the center of uh, excellence of eloquence, I'm told, for the whole country of India. And uh, it's a little intimidating, but uh, I do have to say we have a panel that's very, very difficult to intimidate. So uh, we will move forward immediately. Um, we're in a new world. Uh, Governor Cuomo said, there's no way we're going back to the past. The only option is to create a new future. And it's up to us to create that new future and there's a lot of uncertainty about how it will be created. And there's no area of our lives where there's more uncertainty than uh, how we are gonna educate ourselves for this new world and how our children and our grandchildren are going to e educate themselves. And I, and I use educate themselves expressly because the world has changed to the extent where it's no longer possible for a teacher to educate a child. And so we need new ways of doing that. And we really have so many paths in front of us. And what I'd like to do is, is ask Satish to frame the discussion by laying out just what our situation is today and where do we have agreement? Where do we have disagreement? What paths can we see? What paths do we not see well at all? Satish, could you lay out that framework for us? Thank you very much, David. Um, in fact, when I first saw that flights were being stopped and we were getting into the panic mode of dealing with COVID and what we didn't know what we are heading into. And soon, without losing momentum, I realized that many questions which are now emerging are the ones we began discussing some 30 years ago. Uh, when 
Michael Hort, who was trying to become the information manager for tomorrow, we asked some of these questions. How do we connect in the future? And what didn't seem possible until just about beginning of March. By the time early April, I learned that many, many of my friends, they began becoming comfortable with the new world where uh, a few things happened. We did not know how the world will take the loads of so much information flow across. Will it collapse? The world's internet did not collapse anywhere. We got used to it. And somehow or the other, the questions which were being posed for the last 30, 40, 50 years, how can we use computers? And from there to move to the artificial intelligence and questions of robotics and, and, and many other uh, challenges that emerged. And as we keep, kept evolving, we kept asking ourselves questions. And, and from the web to uh, internet to Internet of Things now, uh, remotely managing um, so many stuff that began. But the biggest impact was felt on the schools. The schools, because they, they basically take at any point in time, about one, one quarter of our um, population is engaged in going to school every day. And schools were shut down. It, it changed a lot of, uh, it changed the sociology of uh, um, our society basically looking at the questions of how do we handle children at home, how do we handle families at home, and, and, and a whole new set of questions emerged. Like David said, uh, there was a French finance minister who said in February, we will know the world now on before co coronavirus and after coronavirus. AD and BC will become uh, BC and AC, AC effectively. Having said that, uh, the learning environment was the first to be impacted because it impacted our children, our future. I mean, if they don't really learn and go to school and that question is everywhere being debated, doesn't matter how affluent a society, they're all dealing with the same question of how to open schools, how to get children onto the path that they were to, um, to be there every day. And, uh, and the questions, uh, question, that, that question took me to what we began as a journey, like Vivek just said, in one laptop per child. Sometime around early, um, you, you, you could look at 2001 to 2005, at MIT, Media Lab created a project called One Laptop Per Child. The purpose of that laptop was uh, to help children learn as if they were in the environment of the best possible school on the planet, without having infrastructure, without having um, electricity or internet, or a, even a school building, so to say, or even a teacher. If there was nothing, how would children, the citizens of future learn? That was the experiment that MIT began with. And it, it, it succeeded in, in more ways than one in countries like Uruguay, where every single child went through the process. Of course, there were lots of questions and people had more questions than answers. And there was disbelief in how could it do so. And, and nothing is perfect, nor was one laptop per child. But even today, when I try to create a solution uh, to, to how you would learn as a child in the current world with today's facilities, I think the one laptop per child initiative uh, comes out as uh, an extraordinary feat of uh, research and development and innovation at that point in time. Even today, it's something the world can embrace to its own advantage as such. I would say that, um, what, so what was it? It was trying to imagine education is not about just a piece of technology. It's not just, just about books. It's not just about any of the pieces that we have put together in our educational infrastructure. My son, seven year old, he wasn't going to a school one day and I just asked him what was the reason. He said, who wants to go to school? I said, why don't you want to learn? So of course I want to learn. So then why won't you go to school? He said, because in the school, we don't learn. We only meet our friends and we go to get educated. What is education? Education is what you tell me to read and learn. Teacher tells me to read, what's learning? What I want to learn. That kind of definition of learning and education, it never had struck me until that day when my seven-year-old child, <clears throat> some 15 years back, told me, today he's, a, he's done his PhD in teacher at uh, Sussex and Imperial uh, School College of Science in, in uh, UK. He teaches law. And my point is, 
this is the way current generation was working. Second, I saw my children were playing with Mario at two years of age. Uh, my son was able to, at seven years of age, write 200 text messages in a day. And from there, when I go and look at a village children where, for instance, in Ganga, Ganga Nagar, in Shri Ganga Nagar, Rajasthan, where I donated some old PC laptops and or school katha, et cetera, look at it. Life before old PC laptops and after, it was an extraordinary difference in the way children thought and learned and their learning and, uh, and precision and curiosity. There was a whole world of difference as if it was a transformational step. That opportunity is in front of us today, depending on how we go about it. If we look at it just providing a Zoom based some teaching and learning, we will not go to the next stage. One thing about, I would say, that, that defines the learning that we go through in India and government schools, at least, and, and in, the, in the US and Europe as such, is between the same education and learning. For instance, I would say that we went through the road. So for us, two into two was four and two into three was six, and we exactly knew it, you knew the table. But when you ask something else, we did not know how to do it. When I came to study in the US, <clears throat> the question was not that two plus two is four, but why? Why is two plus two four? So the difference between innovation happens at a very small level of changing the basically, you know, uh, the trajectory of our learning. To accept something as a given and to look at that with curiosity, that makes a difference between a society that will remain the way it's progressing as snail space or a society that's going to become the innovation lab of the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's one reason I see. I went in 1995 to a conference and uh, it was a Comdex, I think, in, in the US, my first Comdex. It's a massive uh, show of whatever technologies world creates at the point in time. And I was totally shocked. There were 600 and I think nine presenters and 592 were from the US and a few from Europe and Japan. And that was the end of the world. This is the showcase of the world where everyone comes, anyone with anything good enough that was then. Even today, I think 90% of showcases basically are so American as such. Even if they are from outside America, they are so engaged. Now, taking that into our education system, we have an opportunity. Are we going to create the education system the way it is there, as if uh, we have done everything the same way as we did yesterday? We turn that into something which is uh, doable, but we forget what is the possibility spectrum. So if today we begin to think in terms of like Vivek, you said that lots of questions of infrastructure, but then there's a lot of possibility that OLPC offered in terms of where there is nothing, how do I provide the best education possible? Sometimes you forget that our villages do not have any of those things, but it's possible even today, despite having nothing else, we can leapfrog into learning. If our people and future citizens begin to learn differently, they begin to articulate differently. They begin to see the world more curiously. I think it will be a great story. What we have tried to do in Edufront, and I don't want to plug in for a startup which I'm supporting, but I, I support several startups. Why I support Edufront is this, that they have tried to create a few things. Learning from every single stakeholder in variety of situations, how they respond to it. And stakeholders are the children, their parents, school teachers, the school principal, the school owners, and of course, the compliance system of the governance and so on and so forth. And they've tried to bring it together and make it simpler, easier. For instance, a child, I heard about longitudinal because I come from healthcare background as well, and we managed large healthcare entities. A patient, a doctor who knows patients' long, longitudinal history is able to provide better information uh, much more quickly and probably with greater safety and lesser risk. There's nothing is perfect here than a doctor who just sees a patient immediately. Now, it may be that somebody is exceptional, but by and large, that helps us uh, achieve uh, you know, much better results as such. So similarly, to how to create a longitudinal system where we can handle how children learn, what are the challenges, where they're good at, help them where they have challenges, challenge them with what they're good at, and we have created a whole new ecosystem. And this can happen even if there is no electricity, there is no internet, there is no school building, there is no teacher. I would like to talk about, we don't look at children learn from each other as well. As a matter of fact, we learn from each other way more than teachers taught us. Teachers taught us what they knew, the knowledge. With, with our peer group, we learned how to 
dissect that knowledge. I think this is an opportunity where, yes, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to close, <laughs> David. What I'm saying is that this is an opportunity not to do things the way we have been always doing. And I'll take the Viveki's point that this, we need to rethink. Of course, we have to go on doing something that we are doing, but when we plan, we have to rethink. And rethink in such a way that uh, how do we take this opportunity, handle things which we can handle, but always look at the future, not just the past, and become future oriented and dealing with it. So I would say that something that gives us an opportunity to connect easily, brings the whole, all the stakeholders together, brings the spectrum of uh, 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 learning and curiosity in a way that no matter where we can learn it, no matter where we are, what is it, the advantages we have, we can still learn it. That will be the path to go. And I think on our panel, I see uh, from Satya to uh, Mr. Chandra, he used to be Secretary of Technical Education. Professor Parucha has been you know, president of a major university system. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm also looking for answers from everyone. But my, my point is that I think that like Vivek, you said the OLPC model offered us a whole world of opportunity. Maybe 15 years later, we can learn from that and plan the future in a way that we can create a whole generation, new generation of people who are more curious. Thank you, David. Great. Satya. Satish has outlined a whole range of options that are in front of us. Uh, there's the options at the village level, there's options at the district level, there's options at the state level, there's options at the country level. We have all these disparate organizations, leaders, entrepreneurs, all these efforts going on, but we already know that many of the investments that have been made have already proven not to work very effectively. So we're working on stuff that somewhere has already been proven not to work. What are the three priorities from your perspective in terms of how we concentrate resources on the things we know can work in this new world? Thanks, uh, David. Yeah, you know, um, the, the wonderful thing about education in India is that it's, it's, it's culturally extremely valued. Like you rightly spoke about uh, the, the, the eloquence that one witnesses uh, when you go to the eastern part of the country, particularly Calcutta, West Bengal. It, does, it comes from a huge amount of focus on education. And education is different from schooling that has already been mentioned by Sudesh by earlier. And uh, you know, actually, if you come to think of it, I, I, I'm going to talk about three specific things that can help us get started and catch up. Um, but before that, a couple of points that I would like to make, David, with your permission. Uh, one is the current architecture of education is just about 100 to 150 years old. You know, the, 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 the modern industrial world-driven wiring of education, where a certain skills, a certain amount of training, a certain kind of uh, things were to be built into the youth to, de to deliver resources or, 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 or youngsters for the post-industrial, mostly colonial-driven world. I, I think that was what the fundamental architecture so, so Satya, how do we change that? I, I yeah. think everyone agrees with you, but what are the three things we can do to change that? Yeah, so, so, so David, a very objective understanding of that will help you move on to the future you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a blink of an eye, which is that the architecture of the industrial revolution has to move now into an information age where whole lot of tons of billions of dollars that we put in physical infrastructure to gain access that all can be now achieved by using technology and that's what is happening uh, and and which means the focus has now to move to excellence from access access can be achieved at a fraction of a cost and how do you do that two specific things i'll focus on to begin with and then and then leave it open for discussion later number one is reskilling and capacity building of educators 
teachers and education managers, all the way up to policy leaders. People who are making policies today, it is likely that they are suffering from a technological phase lag of a decade or five years, and five years is equal to 20 years today. So you, that's, that's one place that I will put a lot of emphasis and some experiments, uh, including what we have done in the last three months in the Delhi government, with about 200,000 students, 200 teachers of government schools going online without interruption due to COVID, it's, it's a great example. And there are two or three such examples that are plan, planning out in India, in a couple of countries in Africa. So terrific examples to go by and, and replicate for everyone. That's point number one. Point number two is it's going to be now a network of of, of, of career moves and not linear. You know, somebody goes to 10 plus two plus four and then post graduation and then picks up a job. That entire architecture is getting dismantled. Companies now are saying, I don't need a graduate or a postgraduate. Companies such as Google, Dell, uh, consulting companies, my own company. We say that you've done your grade 12, come on in, get your skills, Take, do internships, after some time, go back to college and come back, which means learning is now becoming on demand and it will become legitimately on demand. And it's not that the guy who drops off is a maverick. So, okay, so, so Sacha, that's, that's great. Those are two things. I think yeah. those are things that many people would agree need to be done. What I'd like to do is move over to Dr. Jamshed and he's coming more from the higher education side and much of what you're suggesting in order to have it happen at scale would require higher education to change how they do their work. So Dr. Jamshed, can you comment about how that could happen, how teachers' roles and students' roles could be changed while maintaining the student's desire to learn as opposed to destroying it. And also parents, there's a question on the chat about how do we help parents to be better teachers, please. Thank you, thank you. My approach comes from my research field, which is cognitive neuroscience. There is now a substantial body of research on how the brain learns. One of the things about education is that everybody has an opinion and everybody is absolutely certain of their opinion. But now we have data, we have research on what actually works best in the classroom, out of the classroom, at different age groups. And so the science of learning, I won't have time to go through the major principles of, of what uh, that has revealed, but the central piece is what's called active learning and that means that the child's or even the adult if it's a if it's adult education the, the child's brain must be engaged and you can't do it by just saying pay attention okay it doesn't work it's the teachers or the parents job to make sure the child is engaged and the one thing that is most powerful in engaging the brain is to have the child actively participate in the learning process okay which means speak it means solving problems it means participating so at the very beginning the first thing that we have to get rid of is this idea of lecturing okay uh, we have this sense that we get up in front of students and we transmit information okay it is a it's a it's a model that had uh was justified you know centuries ago when it was developed but it is now an obsolete model yes you do have to impart information but in small snippets five minutes seven minutes maximum okay otherwise you lose you lose uh, the children particularly online online it's easy for somebody to look at the camera and nod but be doing something on their phone okay uh, texting or emailing or even on their computer and I'm sure some of you are doing that right now 
So it's the teacher's job online to have the students engaged. And the way to engage them is to call them by name. So you pose a question to the class, you call David. Uh, what are your, what's your response to my question? Okay. Uh, you need to mix it up online. Okay. You can't just have one hour or even 45 minutes of just the same format. You lose the children. Remember, if we're talking about small children, their attention spans are very short and they're easily distractible and you can't punish them for that. That's how they are. Even college students, they're adolescents, okay? They may attend class, but their mind is on something else, you know? They're, they've got raging hormones, they've got cricket matches coming up, all kinds of things are competing for their brain's attention. You as the teacher have to do that and you can do it by mixing it up. Mix up your, your remarks, to five to seven minutes, then have some uh, pose questions to the students, call them by name so that they have to be prepared. Every single student should speak in every single class, okay? Communication is one of the biggest scandals in the Indian education system. Students do not get the practice speaking, uh, uh, particularly, or, or even writing. Um, there are uh, uh, many other things. Now, if you are talking about scaling up, David, did you want me to, to address that, the scaling issue as well? Uh, Why don't we leave that for further in, Dr. Jamshed? And what yeah. I'd like to do is have Dr. Desai <laughs> give us a viewpoint on everything we've discussed so far coming from Kenya. And give us a, a, a bit of a window into how things are different in Africa, if they are how they're similar, and in particular, how do we create what I would call test set scale, which I think is something you'll also address later, Dr. Jamshed. We need larger tests that show us that something can succeed at scale, and we need to, do, we need to figure out which of those to do and which of those to forget. So give us a window into how Kenya is approaching this, Dr. Desai. Well, I think it's uh, very similar with respect to the challenges of COVID-19 and um, what um, my colleagues on the panel have said. You know, there's, um, of course, the challenge, but there's the opportunity. And one mustn't um, forget, you know, that the opportunity is uh, quite exceptional because, after all, if you're looking at information te communication technologies, it's fundamental contributions include a system that promotes greater interactive interactivity and openness. And if we look to Kenya's context or India's context, I think that, you know, the two pillars that we need to address are uh, access to electricity and access to information. Kenya has made great strides with respect to finding ways in which it provides energy through solar solutions. And, um, a couple of days ago, we launched uh, the Google balloon systems, which promote internet connectivity throughout its uh, country. In fact, even as I speak, I speak to you from the rural areas, and we must consider the challenges with respect to that issue that you brought up. You know, how do you scale? Well, from a rural setting, there are ch challenges of access, because how do we build and replicate systems throughout the countrysides with respect to teachers and equipment and infrastructure. And ICTs can provide a solution with respect to satellite uh, solutions. The challenge of equity, you know, how do we find ways in which we're able to promote education to less endowed people or people who are unable to afford transportation? aspects of quality, you know, how do we promote standards as well as uh, relevance? How, how do we ensure that local communities are involved? Well, the ICT solution is a solution in the sense that it can promote greater interactivity and greater synergy and scale, and at the same time, promote greater sustainability by way of cutting costs and capacities. So even if we look at further on down the line, as we promote curiosity, creativity, and energy in our youth. 
we must realize, you know, that um, as panelists have mentioned, that a modular exercise and capacity is required. And it's within the ICT and digital space that we're able to find many of the solutions with respect to skills development across the entire continuum, you know, from primary education all the way up to university and um, of course skills development and capacities which highly are uh, being, uh, as, uh, the aspiration has been to see how it connects to standards, standards that are measurable, standards that promote quality. So therein lies the solution for scale. And I think that we, we are at a time where we need to show a tremendous amount of leadership more than at any time on how we're able to usher in a transformation in education. And this is essentially what we're trying to do in Kenya. We have great examples. Thank you, Dr. Sai. We have great examples of success stories on the skills side, but we also have massive waste. We, we have situations in India where uh, only 12% of the people who went through the uh, and, uh, different programs that were offered by NCSD, I think I got that right, um, ended up getting actual jobs. Uh, they trained way too many hairdressers and not enough uh, people with even you know, rudimentary technical skills to take the burgeoning jobs there. So we've got this challenge that we see every day in terms of the skill side. But Axel, if I want to get to the point on the skills side where I have students that are prepared to take on those more challenging tasks, I've got to do a better job at the fundamental side. And right now, a lot of the technology that's being delivered is off the shelf, standard, um, you know, suites of videos, uh, this application, that application. It's, it, you know, it's not designed to be tailored and customized to a new way of teaching. Can you share some ideas about what you think will work that's different than the way we've done it in the past? Well, uh, we have here a complex situation. You know, like every, every person who, is, who goes to hospital with symptoms, they are not suffering from one disease alone. Usually it gets complicated because there are several things that need improvement and the improvement has to be coordinated in a way. Um, so this Jar said in his initial talk, uh, uh, interesting uh, remark about his uh, child that they want to learn, but they don't want to go to school. So why don't they want to go to school? Because it's not entertaining, but they can go binge watching TV. They go for the fifth, sixth or 10th sequel of The Hobbits, although it's always the same, but it's in a certain way, it is, um, it's entertaining. And because it is entertaining, the students not only are interested in learning, they even learn better. We know from brain science, that the way to keep knowledge only comes from positive emotion. So if you do something with joy, with fun, then it will stay in your brain. Then you will keep your interest in this one. Um, the second symptom that goes hand in hand, and this is a typical problem in India, but it's a more out of the colonial legacy from the British way of schooling is that most colleges in India are not colleges. They are job placement agencies because they make money from, uh, from, from placing their students at the same time and they take money from the students for placing them. They are trying to educate them to the desire of a current customer. But that means that in IT, for example, if I train everybody on Oracle software and all of a sudden Oracle is no longer fashion, now we want Microsoft software, then all these Oracle people, they have no clue about the principles, how software in general works. So they have, they have, they're basically untrained when they're going for a job. 
And that is what you, David, says is actually in the end, you only have hair cutters. Um, but there is no demand for hair cutters because now we need to stylists or something like this. So the way um, there, so the solution for this one is not easy to say. But first of all, I see government very much in demand to find out ways to make colleges again learning institutes where students learn things and are not just training them for a product that a certain customer of them demands. So this should be regulated on a way uh, when syllabus and, uh, and already uh, the, the, the definition of the standards is defined, then you come back to, to solutions like you have in Germany. Germany is known for its quality, but why it's known for its quality? Because the German education system is standardized. That comes from the old guild system. A baker or a butcher or, 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 or even a, a medical doctor, a nurse, they all learn the same things in the first years of their studies. Only in the end they specialize. So if you build standards, then you have a fundament for your students and then they can take every profession what they need. So if you were a hair cutter, in the end, they maybe go there and become a gardener or they become uh, even um, uh, somebody who is doing something for ecology, this one. So that is, for me, the point is government has to define standards and school have to become media publishing institutes who produce entertaining content that attracts the students. And the last part that is, was mentioned before also when you say that um, students did not learn to express themselves in school. They are not taught to speak. Well, the new world will probably go like this. We learn from entertaining video. We discuss the complicated and integrate things with an AI based uh, software or a computer game that teaches it and then the teacher sits with the students and they discuss as they did it always in universities those who were in university they remember we have similar things like a panel here we call it a colloquium and that is the real part of learning it's not sitting in, in an auditory and listen to the professor this you can read yeah. in the book but sitting with the thank other thank students, you, Axel. Thank that's, you. A, that's a solution so i I think we can see here that there's a number of different ideas that sound really great when we talk about them and we can call out examples of where they've worked. Generally, as many of our listeners are pointing out in the chat box, the examples we call out are resource rich or resource modest areas. Uh, whereas we've got a hundred million children in India who are not in either of those areas, <coughs> but in those four areas, and, and the priority of education that Indian parents want to put on their children isn't an option in many cases. So, Dr. Raghav, could you talk a little bit about those hundred million children? Uh, there are examples in India where organizations have gone out into the remote villages and set up single teacher schools that have functioned reasonably well. Some of them have an ideological side to them that may be seen as a negative in West Bengal and, and, and uh, other places. But, you know, if you've set up 100,000 single teacher schools in remote villages, that's going to deal with a lot of these different issues in a very pragmatic on the ground way that the theory doesn't doesn't work so please share with us your experience in dealing with those issues on the ground in the, for those 100 million children who who for whom as as my friend snore suggested on in the chat box maybe we need some kind of campaign for one smartphone per family that gives them the basic technology that would change that reality. Just one suggestion from, from our listeners, please. Yeah, so uh, thanks, David. Uh, 
I'm looking at it largely from the, uh, you know, from the larger perspective of uh, tribal areas, backward, far-flung areas, and the entire issue of equity in education. Uh, I'm not an educationist. I have worked in education, and so I have some idea, especially in the tribal areas. And I think it is very, very important to the Indian context to look at our entire system of educational infrastructure uh, in a manner in which we are able to, you know, while single uh, teacher, schools, remote areas, far-flung areas, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. However, I feel that too much of decentralization to remote areas, you are really wasting a lot of your energies and uh, a lot of your uh, competencies because teachers do not go to remote areas. And in India, the biggest problem is in tribal and far-flung areas, teacher attendance is very poor. Uh, most teachers want themselves transferred to at the drop of a hat as soon as they get uh, a politician of their choice to an area okay. where uh, they can stay with their families. Uh, so they would at best spend a few months in a tribal area and therefore those uh, schools are very poorly populated in terms of teachers. So the solution to that in my view is that while there is nothing wrong in making an attempt to get open those uh, far-flung schools, we must also have a scheme of consolidated school clusters where they have adequate infrastructure. So they are pooled infrastructure of uh, sports, pooled infrastructure for cultural activities, pooled uh, infrastructure for debates, uh, uh, cultural programs and such like, and where the faculty should also stay in those clusters. Because I've seen one such model in Chindwara and Madhya Pradesh, where there is a cluster of about 10 or 12 educational boarding schools, and the teachers stay in the campus and the educational standards are significantly higher. So if you can bring in this network externality ap uh, approach, to education you would be making it more cost effective and beneficial and you'll be setting paragons of excellence which need to be copied by other schools because unless you have centers of excellence you will not have that we also so, have so, the uh, raghav let's take that example let's take that a group of school example that you just outlined yes let's say you thought that was a great idea you thought that could potentially spread across four or five states in India. Yes. How would you go about communicating to the appropriate people such that five other sets of schools created a simultaneous effort to actually implement that so that you would have a level of visibility into whether it really would work at a level of scale that makes it relevant. Uh, so this would have to be, uh, uh, you know, an in principle approach adopted by the government. So even today, for instance, the uh, we are opening what are known as Eklavya model uh, schools for the tribal areas. We have the Navodaya Vidyalayas. Uh, we have the central schools. These are all very good schools. But again, the emphasis has been to disaggregate and decentralize them to sometimes in locations where even though they are only 30 kilometers away from a city, a teacher would not want to go there. He would want to come back to the city in the night and sleep in his own home, he would rent an accommodation and not stay in the campus. So I'm just enunciating a principle that we need to ensure that we have clusters of school with clusters of infrastructure uh, added together. I, because even going forward for the future, even in terms of digital infrastructure, which is what is going to be required as we go ahead in the future, it will be much easier, more cost effective and beneficial to have it all in these clusters. Because then you can have an auditorium, you can have digital screens, other than give each little school a small digital screen, you can have one large digital screen, you can have larger auditoriums, better infrastructure and you would get the teachers to stay there. So infrastructure is something which is very important, physical infrastructure. Along with that, digital infrastructure is equally important. And for digital infrastructure, we need to 
ensure that we get the right equipment, whether it is the one laptop, and I'm all for it. Uh, today, it's an absolutely sin qua non to provide a digital uh, tablet or a laptop. India and countries like India must learn to produce them cheap and ensure that they are available to uh, teachers, to students, to parents even at uh, a subsidized cost. And television channels, at least 50% or 40% of the TV channels must have educational, gamified and educational content. So as to make it so attractive, that students, instead of watching news, uh, you know, which may be repetitive, or instead of watching film serials, are automatically driven towards watching educational content. So that's on the infrastructure. Quickly on, uh, you know, the systems approach, we do need local AC Indian systems of integrated learning, which need to be, you know, built in. Today we only have international systems like, uh, you know, Blackboard and uh, Moodle and Canvas and so on. They need to be replicated into the Indian context. In terms of language, which is equally important, we need to make our language learning, you know, I, I'm getting an app developed of my own for an educational uh, uh, software, and I'm going to the best company in the country, but it's horrific that the command over the language is very poor, and therefore we need to ensure that we have a functional command over the English language, which is a sine qua non of any going forward app development or learning rather than you know general english learning of the kind that we did in our days with grammar and all that and that was the reason why sanskrit failed and that is the reason why moving forward english will fail we need to make it more functional uh, we need so, to incentive so, uh, yeah sorry that that's great that, that's very very helpful and uh, you know everyone listening should should sense that this set of challenges is one that if we continue to do business as usual, it's going to take decades to make progress. So somehow we have to change how we're working. And COVID has demonstrated how that impacts education directly, but we are not doing as good a job of taking the learnings from COVID and transferring them to how we work. And we're going to need to do that. Maybe, maybe uh, in a month or so, we should do another session where we focus on that. But the example I will quickly say, Anil Swarup, when he went from the coal ministry to the education minist national education ministry, threw out all the mafia. He'd thrown out the mafia in the coal industry, threw out the mafia in the education industry. That opened up space where two or three great entrepreneurs were able to bring uh, uh, solutions. One that got 32,000 out of school children in Haryana back into the schools. Snorri Westgard's listening now. He's the one who led that effort out of Human Humana People to People India. That's now got MOUs for six other states. That never would have happened had the mafia not been gotten rid of. There wasn't space. All the money was going to the mafia, or most of it. And there wasn't space for the new application. Satish runs into this problem all the time, where he needs to open up the space so we can go to a Samsung or an Apple and say, look, we've got 10,000 schools who are willing to try this. Are you interested in having a conversation about 10,000 schools actually trying it? Satish, do you want to comment? Well, I think, you know, uh, my sense is this. Right now, we have to rethink in the current times, how do we, uh, you know, make education and learning possible? One good thing I find is people are speaking more about digital learning than digital education. So if we restructure it, many of the questions that you pose, they will disappear. If you keep thinking the same way, they will remain there with us. So, I mean, I'm looking at some of the questions people are asking. People ask them, how do we do it? Now, if you just do it the way technology delivers, you will not achieve the essence of what learning is all about. You can get education that way, but you won't get learning. But a few things are happening, and you have to watch that. How do teachers come together? How do uh, students come together. David, I'm not answering your question because time is short. 
I am trying to uh, take it to the to where I'm seeing people, people seek the questions. So I would say it's not just about zooming. It's not just about connecting. It's about how do we come together. So for instance, I noticed that uh, in the Indian classrooms, the schools, children will not go prepared for tomorrow as prepared as I saw in the Western uh, classrooms as such. Today, now the systems are changing. People will have to prepare. In other words, the questioning spirit can be brought into our discussion once again using uh, the, the, the new opportunity that we have. So the teacher doesn't have to tell them one, two, three, four. The teacher has to start questioning them. So, so they begin, begin to become curious. How do we do that is the basic challenge I'm facing and everybody's asking the question. And that's where we're all learning. In the US, I find the questions are about the softer aspects. In India, the questions about harder technology infrastructure aspect. And which is totally makes sense because infrastructure doesn't exist there. How do we create that cheaply? How do we create that instantly? And that's possible. What we are, at least I'm suggesting is this. As long as you have any screen possible, and you, today India's population of PDAs has gone up. I was quite skeptical about how a small screen will work for learning. But today I think small screen is the panacea, is the only thing available. Let's use them wherever they are. Uh, some school systems have looked at just for the teachers and not the students. Well, if you have two screens, one for school uh, teacher and one for the uh, students, maybe that will help. But we have to find solutions to this right now. And right now, cannot wait too long. So let's look at what's available. So stock of any small screen, let's take them to the villages. At least uh, in India, the infrastructure for internet communication has improved greatly and we can leverage that. And I think uh, Satya could probably share with us some um, practical experience that he has had. From what I'm seeing, the schools where I'm contributing at, at um, our own initiative, so to say, teachers have to be taught, prepared well before they go to the students. So we've created groups of teachers and students. Among students, you have to get a group of people who are going to be championing them. And then you slowly get everybody included. In other words, it's not just a pill that you give to them, you get to plan for it. Then again, there are, there are schools where population of screens is only 10%. So how do we bring students together in this time? How do you use audio and video together? In other words, a lot of innovation will happen. There is no uh, one you know, size fits all solution here as such. So we got to think together. And, and that's why you know, such conversations help us. I would say that, uh, uh, David, we should look at John Dial's questions. Very, very important questions. So let, Maybe you can pick that up. Let me see if I can combine a couple of questions into a, a theme or a counterpoint that a couple of you could comment on. Uh, this one, I think uh, Jamshed and Axel would be the best commenters, maybe about two minutes each. So it's the juxtaposition of what Steve Ross says the canon of what should be taught should be much more open and to question and to change what's being taught and enable what's being taught to change and shift much more rapidly. If you juxtapose that against uh, Richard Close's comment that project learning is much more difficult online and therefore what essentially you need to have happen is project learning needs to happen without a teacher running the project. So how do we mix that issue of not having the teacher running the project and enabling the change in content and flexibility to be driven by the student? Two minutes, Jamshed and Axel. Jamshed, please. Sure, thank you. Uh, you know, teaching is very difficult. I've taught for hundred years and uh, a, a good teacher is always trying to improve. Teaching online is also difficult and we should not try to simply export our in-class teaching methods or even the curriculum to the to the online mode. It does not transfer well. I just finished teaching a course at Dartmouth College where I've been you know I was on the faculty for many years to 161 students course on cognition and these are you know it's Ivy League these are fabulous students 
uh, it's tough. It's tough. So when we talk about scaling up to 100 million, you know, younger students uh, in India, it's tough. So nothing worthwhile is easy. Education is very difficult. But we are mostly doing things the wrong way. My view about Indian education at all levels is very straightforward. But I'll speak for higher education because that's the space I know very well. It needs to be reformed. It needs to be deregulated. It needs to be disrupted. And here, I respectfully disagree with my distinguished panelist, uh, Axel Angeli. India is a vast, vast country of such diversity. I don't think the German model of standardization will work. I think the top-down government-controlled approach to higher education in India has done a tremendous amount of damage to the country. And the most important thing that can happen in Indian higher education is for the central government and its highly bureaucratic regulatory agencies to get out of the way. And you will see an explosion, explosion of outstanding institutions, which is happening now in private uh, Indian universities that are emerging almost every year. I've been part of several and I've joined another one that's going to come up called Sai University in, in Chennai. Start from fundamental principles of how the brain learns and do the right thing. Experiment, innovate, and push back on the government regulators. Thanks. Thanks. They don't know what they're doing. Thank Sorry. You. Uh, so we have a little mini debate here, which I love. Axel, two minute response. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Axel. <laughs> yeah, uh, said, I think uh, th th this is such a, um, let's say, deep topic, I think, that would deserve a completely different panel to discuss this. I'm not really contradicting you. Uh, it's the way how regulation takes place, but regulation must be a kind of attraction or a guidance. Like you cannot regulate a, a, a stream of water, but you can build him a bed. And as long as the water flows in the bed, then you have the right, um, yeah, Reiner to go to, to move on, on, on the outside. So, um, but um, uh, I think that distracted me from your initial question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Axel. Uh, okay, we, we will take that to one answer. to the side. We will either do it in a future session or, or we'll <laughs> move things forward in another way. Um, what was the question? That, that I'm going to move on to some, I'm going to move on to some other <laughs> comments and questions. So, you know, there's been several people who've talked about the deficiency of infrastructure uh, in the rural villages. And Raghav made some very important points about the fact that certain things will not be solved by doing it in every remote village. And yeah. there may need to be completely different kinds of solutions that are uh, you know, somehow digitally based without the teacher going to the village or some other solution. Uh, okay, Marilyn, my friend. I'm back with you. I, um, I, ha um, I have a suggestion here in this one. And that has to do with the way how we should also change the way of learning. We should come back to learn in the way how industry does projects. So learning in remote areas is a kind of, that, that that's an area of research. We are at the beginning. So why would we try to come up with a solution and then again impose the solution to the students or to the teachers? Why don't we transform the school into the institute that finds the solution? let the school work on finding the solution. And while they find the solution, they learn. Axel, here I'm, here I'm going to disagree with you. Not that that's any better than Jamshed disagreeing, but if you, if you look at the things that he mentioned, if you look across India, if you look at all the states and you look at all the places where problems have been solved, yeah. you can find at least two dozen, what I would call tests at scale that have already been done. Mm -hmm. They've already done the test. They've already <laughs> achieved a certain amount of progress. That thing is ready to go. It just needs to be compared with the other dozen that compete with it so that you can pick the best solutions and put them together. So um, 
Marilyn, my friend from Sweden, makes the point that we all have to operate as both teachers and learners. And we know that we won't always have the infrastructure to do that. We know that there will be requirements to do it in different ways that don't always require the infrastructure. Now, Satish will disagree with me on this, but does anybody have some examples whereby going away from the technology, a problem was solved at scale? Any thoughts? Satya? Well, I, I would have a thought. <laughs> <laughs> You, you know, I mean, uh, David, you might take the example of Ekal um, as uh, scaling without technology. It's the yes, least technology-intensive example. I think with the Bharti school system, which is a very, very large one with some 4 million students, they have done uh, quite, a, quite a good job in some ways. But all that does not measure up to what the challenges of our times are. They can help us become, you know, instead of we can learn a few words and sentences and numbers but that is not learning what's all about the potential of every child is to become anything that mankind has ever been why should parents and teachers turn them into their own mirror images as such so if we don't know which child in which in indian village is going to be tomorrow's einstein but we are ensuring that they will not be instead of letting them probably explore the possibilities that is where the challenge is ensuring that the potential which is lying there which we don't know, which is totally untapped, how does it become something that it can potentially become rather than just turn them into people who are numbers? And that's where the challenge is. In 70 years, India hasn't looked at untapped potential. It takes credit for demographic dividend, but doesn't, doesn't figure out that demographic dividend only works when we ensure that every human being operates at the highest potential level, not the lowest, which is the 95% of the nation that it's looking at. And that's what our challenge is. In fact, I would, I would suggest you look at some of John Dayal's questions. They need answering by everyone. And, and, and that would be, um, it's as good to answer. Probably Satya has practical answers. Raga will have from the government perspective, and we can take a minute or two. That would be very interesting. From my point of view, technology can be laid out. But how we build around that, how, what conversations happen, how do we handle it, that would be very, very important. Somebody asked me, learning and teaching brains, they exist in us all the time. They don't exist at two different points in time, and they're inside each one of us. Let's understand that, let's accept that, that learning and teaching happens together, simultaneously, all the time. It's not Dr. a very different function. And let's let's ask Dr. Desai to comment on that, Satish. Yes, Dr. I just, you comment yes, on I, that? Yes, I, I, um, I think that this is uh, far more simpler than what we're debating, actually. If we look back uh, pre-technology times, it was the communities, it was the, um, the people around the child that brought up a child. And, you know, even if we can extend that to an African saying, it takes a village to bring up a child. But then, you know, technology can provide the other potential with respect to ensuring that uh, training is competency-based and therefore promoting a harmonization with world requirements. So I think that, you know, we need to balance both potentials, the potential that exists in being inclusive to communities, cultures, unique uh, methods that ensure the inclusion of a child after education. And then of course, the possibility that you can promote uh, a link to other parts of the world and promote the world uh, education system. Excellent, excellent. So there's a comment from uh, Bashwati B. Why does everyone wait for what the government should do? All great schools come from a rebelling against the status quo. Uh, Bashwati, I would recommend that Satish's comments on Vijay Bharati and Echol are two examples of exactly your point. They're not government uh, run and, and, they're, and they've scaled without government support. Um, so, you know, those are examples. Um, We've got uh, several comments that I would kind of call process comments. They're comments about how our new ability to chunk content and our new ability to deliver customized content to a student based on their requests as opposed to the teacher's requests. 
Uh, one of the examples I've seen, which Anil Swarup brought in, was this out of school children example, where they printed 50,000 of five workbooks and delivered those to the kids. And the teachers just managed the process of the kids going through the workbooks that were mapped to the education competencies that the system requires you to go back into school. And the 32,000 kids went back into school and competed reasonably well with their peers in government schools after having spent six to nine months self-learning through those printed materials. So you know, there are alternatives and different approaches that we're seeing. In a sense, has anybody seen a situation where the content has been aggregated from multiple sources and the intelligence added to help the student get the content they need? Are there examples of that? Satya, I see you shaking your head. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. In the, in the, in the digital world, that, that can be done quite effortlessly. Now, for example, in, in my own uh, uh, enterprise company that we do, uh, the first step is, is about diagnostics, which, which takes a simple 30 minute assessment that, that a student goes through and it throws out a very specific personalized learning path for the student with milestones, outcomes, etc., predefined. And, 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 and he goes at the pace at which he goes, and you could start with assessment, learn, revise, reassess, and move forward. Yes, it's, 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 you know, I have been a teacher for the last 25 years. And uh, when a teacher has conviction in technology, like what Jim Sheet was saying, then you will not take the practices from the offline world blindly onto the digital world. You, you pick the principles and then, and then apply those principles and innovate using the possibilities of the newer technologies so that there is engagement, there is curriculum transaction, there is learning, there is assessment, and there is a measured outcome. All of these have to be done by the teacher. Yes, in short, yes. Excellent, thank you. So I'm just gonna quickly give one minute to each of the panelists to summarize what they would recommend, uh, and then uh, I'll finish up with a final comment. Uh, can we start with you, Jamshed? Yes, certainly. Um, I certainly reiterate what I said before about massive deregulation uh, in education in India at all levels and, and uh, open the doors for innovators, some of whom are on, on this show, to go in and try different kinds of, of, of methods. Um, I do agree uh, with uh, Axel and others that in the future, AI-based personalized teaching will come. It's all, the, there's some tremendous research being done at Stanford on uh, uh, AI-based personalized teaching of computer science. Obviously, in subjects like computer science, it'll happen sooner than it will in you know literature or the arts and so on, where it's much more difficult. But tracking the development of each student's brain in a particular subject, the kinds of things that they can do and not do, and then give them problems that elevate them, uh, is will be here in 10 years, uh, if not sooner, for subjects like mathematics and computer science. Thanks, Jamshed. If, if you could pick uh, you know, a short article that you think is the best summary of that and share it with us, we'll share it with the participants. Uh, I will, but th these are advanced, this is advanced research, but I'm happy to do that. Yeah, but there's got to be a summary piece written on the directions people are going. Rock, I'll, I'll, I'll send something very soon on, you, on your chat. Yeah, one second. Yeah, okay. Raghav, two-minute summary, please. Are you with us? We need to hasten our uh, broadband uh, penetration. So we have a huge project called the Bharat Net, which has only a 2% uh, penetration of internet uh, in the panchayat level. That needs to be ramped up uh, on a war footing. And we need to have digital screens at the panchayat level so that uh, children can sit around and more television or, uh, or digital channels which will provide uh, useful, uh, happy 
intelligent uh, content which is easily understood by students at all levels. So it should be media friendly, education friendly, and we need to have a cluster approach to our physical infrastructure and ensure that our education is simplified. At least some basic things like uh, uh, language which is useful for future digital learning is definitely imbibed. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Desai. I think that, you know, greater flexibility is required and um, we need to ensure that as educationists, we open this capacity and be inclusive to all. I think that the very values that we've talked about today, which include access, equity, quality and relevance, can't be more relevant at this particular time. And then we, we have to realize that technology is a means to achieve those values. And leadership is absolutely critical at this moment. And I think it has to be inclusive so as to create a new transformative system that really is um, of uh, great relevance to this time. Great, Th thank you for setting that example in Kenya. Axel? Two minutes summary. Now it's unlocking. Now it's unlocking. No, no, it was unmuted. Um, yes, so uh, there have been already uh, set some suggestions. So I would uh, try to stress the point that the future way of learning should be gamified. So we should concentrate on gamification of our schools. That has to do also with artificial intelligence in there and uh, in practice uh, transform the schools into workshops where the students collaborate, work together and practice what they have learned before in the, uh, in the internet. Excellent, thank you. Satya? Yeah, two specific points, David. Uh, one is, as Raghav mentioned, leadership is going to be very critical. Uh, but leadership with funds is what is very important. You know, in, in the Delhi government experiment that we did, that has got a budget of $3 billion, which, which is a ton of money for a small state like Delhi. We couldn't get them to spend $100,000 to take 200,000 kids online for a two-year program because it is seen as something that should come to me free of cost. So leadership, but with a person who can write checks from the government is very important. That's number one. But more importantly, it has come up in a couple of observations, even from the audience. We can't be waiting for the governments to do. There are, it's too unwieldy. Even the most dynamic and honest civil servant finds it hugely challenging. And having known many of them very closely, I know how frustrating it is for them. I think the, the path will be shown only by uh, some MVPs, some pilots that go on to acquire such great PR, uh, success stories, that everybody feels that it's not a risky game. That's the path. And, and, and we can put 10% of our money there and get worth as much as 50% of our past budgets. So Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Satish. Thank you, David. I think the first thing is to understand the child who we have to educate is full of potential. Start from today. AIs, everything is good except that we have to create the first ecosystem where this child can get to a point of learning. Otherwise we get kind of caught up in uh, lots of, every question is relevant in the context. In the context of India, what's relevant, that's the first thing. We should be caught up with technology. We should look at what is practical, what's doable, but not from yesterday's point of view, not today's future point of view. So we have to change some of these, the ways we look at it. If the government chooses this way, that Minister of Education will say, every school should be such that I will send my child to that school. That is the baseline that you create. Now you will see immediately a big change happening. That's an opportunity today. We can do that with much less resources using new technologies. And that's where we should focus. That when every principal secretary of education says, if I can't send my child to the school, I will not call it school. Raise the bar. Without raising the bar, nothing will happen. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, David. Yeah. So let, let me just summarize with some uh, a few numbers. Um, where I am right now, it is very, very expensive to test at any level of scale that's relevant. 
it's both expensive just because it's expensive and it's expensive because things are just as calcified here or more so than elsewhere. If we follow uh, Jamshed's advice, or even if we don't follow that advice, in India, the ability to do that same test is, starts out as probably one-tenth the cost and then scales up to maybe one-fifth the cost if you take into account you really want to do it at scale. So you can run five tests in India for what it would cost you to run one test in the U.S. Those pure economics mean that 10 years from now, the U.S. will be importing its educational technology and solutions from India because there's no way it can keep up if India takes advantage of that opportunity and organizes itself in a way that those actual things happen. It, it may not. It may choose to just keep operating the way it's operating. But if it could organize to gain that 5x advantage, it would become the dominant provider of those solutions. So that's my summary in terms of economics. We kept three quarters of our audience for the entire hour and a half. We thank them for staying and we thank those for checked out a little bit earlier than the folks that are still with us. And we thank the panelists, each one of you. Uh, it's such a pleasure for me to get to know all of you. We thank the Merchants Chamber for providing such an excellent sponsorship. And I apologize for being on a Mac that's so old that it can't use the virtual background. <laughs> but anyway, wonderful to be with you today. Turn it back to the chamber. Uh, th thank you, David. Uh, uh, it is really a very engaging session. So on behalf of the chamber and also on my own, it gives me great pleasure to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. Uh, digital learning is a burning topic these days which has become the panacea post-COVID and the lockdown thereof. Our learned speakers have deliberated on various issues concerning e-education sector in great length. We are extremely thankful to Mr. Satish Jha, Chairman EduFund Foundation, Mr. David Vilox, Founder and CEO, Reach Safe, Dr. Jagdish Barucha, President Emeritus of the Cooper Union, Mr. Axel Angeli, Founder, Logos World, Dr. Kevit Desai, Principal Secretary, EAC Kenya, and Mr. Satya Narayan, Chairman, CL Educate, and Mr. Rajiv Chandra, former civil servant, writer, author for their kind presence and enlightening address today. We thank all the participants for their August presence. We thank the members of the media fraternity for joining us in this program and hope that these deliberations will be carried in your esteemed media in a befitting fashion. Last but definitely not the least, I extend my sincere thanks to our partner for this webinar, Messrs. Edufront Foundation, without whose support this webinar could not have been organized in such a fantastic way. So now may I propose a hearty word of thanks and request you all to carry this with acclamation. Thank you all, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Nice. It was really nice, educated and learning. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. See you soon.